Good evening, everybody, to this Pitch Perfect Session 2, hosted by Start Peninsula. Start Peninsula, this is year 13, I believe, that we're doing this. And the whole thing started because uh, when we first started 13 years ago, pitches were not that good, and we needed to come up with a solution to solve that. And uh, Gary Plague and myself have been working on that. We think that we've done a, a pretty decent job of helping people uh, get their pitch turned around. So this is in preparation for that. However, you will be able to use this information that you learn, regardless the environment. Um, but this does follow the rubric that we have for those that are participating in the micro pitch competition that is going to take place on May 16th. Uh, we're close to selling out. Uh, pitchers are only a couple slots that remain, so uh, act fast before those are gone because we will not resume the next micro pitch until September. So what we will talk about today is the elements of the pitch. Again, I am Tim Ryan. I am, uh, for lack of better terms, I guess like the coordinator program coordinator of Start Peninsula. Gary Flag has been alongside me for uh, quite some time. Gary, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Gary Plagg. I used to live in Williamsburg, but I live in the mountains in North Carolina now. And uh, that's when I met Tim when I lived in Williamsburg. And we started doing working together in 2015-16. And my business is uh, 26 years old this year. And it is a communication consulting business where I help people to practice their, and hone their public speaking skills and the communication skills. And I like doing that. And that's my piece of how I help with Start Peninsula. And what, thank you, Gary. With that said, so Gary and I offset each other really well. Gary uh, focuses uh, primarily on the performance side, and I will focus on the business side. I've been working with early stage founders for this is year 13 now, so I have worked with thousands of founders, just as Gary has worked with uh, thousands of people trying to hone in their uh, performance aspect. So between the two of us, we will get everything dialed in for you and uh, show you the pathway to success. But it is on you to take the initiative, lean into that discomfort because it will be uncomfortable. But as they say, the magic happens outside of your comfort zone and uh, we will push you outside of your comfort zone. And for those that don't know Gary, Gary has a superpower to woo you, woo you out of the comfort and in that uncomfortable zone, but that is only out of love. Uh, we want to see you succeed. I just say lean into the discomfort. That's right. Lean, and then you'll be glad you did. All right. I am going to go ahead and share my screen. And then. Uh, everything should be cool. Everything good on your end, Gary? All right, so this is pitch perfect. We are going to focus on the three minute pitch. And the way that tonight will work is we're going to talk about the elements of the pitch. Just like I said, this is going right from the rubric, but this is also going to be applicable for you here on out for the rest of your time as a founder. And, and as long as you're a founder, you're going to uh, look back on this. Once we're done, we will open everything up for questions. And then you give you an opportunity to practice your pitch, and then we can give you feedback. This is a safe environment. This is a no judgment zone. So that said, everybody is good enough to be here and nobody is too good. So when you entered into this uh, event space, you everyone has checked their ego at the door and there is no judgment made. All right. Let's get going. We're going to put three minutes on the clock so that we can go ahead and get started. The thing that I want everyone to understand is that you need to understand just the pitch in general. So a lot of people have never pitched before, and it really, really seems overwhelming. I mean, you can get really, you just don't even know where to start. So we're going to break this down into bite-sized chunks. This is not exact science. You can uh, give and take time from other places. But we like to uh, suggest folks start with attention getter. It could be a quote. It could be a statistic. It could be anything that is going to get that person's attention other than a question that you wait for someone to respond yes or no. 
We are this this being three minutes, you have a limited amount of time and every second counts, every word counts, every phrase counts, and the most important information needs to be in there. So let's not waste time. So you capture someone's attention. Next thing we want to uh, talk about is the problem or the opportunity. If you have not pitched before, this is the time right now to grab a blank piece of paper, grab a pen, and just start writing down some sentences. The problem that I'm trying to solve is, and just write some basic things down. And then once you once you think that you have the problem documented properly, read that out loud, time yourself, and see how long it is. But we want to keep that within that 50-second window. Then we want you to talk about your solution. That will be another 50 seconds. Uh, and we're going to go into depth in terms of how you can break down that solution. Problems are pretty easy to describe, and that is something that we see over and over again. Gary and I can tell we've heard so many pitches that when people are going to go long, it's on the problem. And then the bad thing is, is that from the rubric standpoint, we know you're going to run out of time and you're not going to get to the solution and you're not going to get to the market. And then you're not going to be able to maximize the points allowable. So. Talk about the solution for 50 seconds, then you have everyone's attention and you can uh, say, state your name, who you are, your company one-liner, so that people know how to remember you. They may not remember your name, but they will remember your pitch and they will remember your one-liner. We suggest that you give someone the one-liner that you, uh, how you want to be remembered, or else one may be assigned to you that you may or may not want assigned. So... Then we're going to go on to the target market. We're going to talk about how you can break that down and how you're going to fill 50 seconds there. Then you have your closing, which is 10 seconds. With that closing, your company one-liner again. And then that, if you total everything up, that is your three minutes. So it is an awful lot to talk about. We're going to break everything down a little bit further. And then you're going to be like, Tim, Gary, this is even more than I realized that we had to have included. And now you can quickly see why you have to maximize your efficiency and you can't waste any time. And Gary will get into this, but talking really fast is not a way to counter the lack of time that you have. So. I call that trying to cram 10 pounds on a five pound bag. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, one of the things that we're going to, uh, so keep this in mind in the back of your head. This is a little aside about uh, some secret sauce that we want to make sure that, that you're focused on. And this is the flywheel. And these are things that you need. And the structure of this pitch is going to identify these three things in order to be successful. So you need to have a product. And so this is what we're talking about when it comes to the solution. You actually have something to offer or you have a solid plan of what it is that you're going to offer that the people that you are marketing to. You need to have a team. Get it. Right now, you might be a single founder. It may be just you. But again, you have to have some sort of plan identifying what it is that you need next and how you're going to fill out that team. And then you also need to have customers. Again, this is a this is a platform to validate your business idea. But you need to be working towards these three things. And when you have those three things, then your business is going to start to grow. If you don't have those, all you have is an idea. And unfortunately, ideas are not worth anything at all. It is just an idea. And so with that, you're going to you create this flywheel. So if you have a product, then you have a team that is building that product. And as that team builds that product, you're going to delight your customers. The more customers that you're able to delight, the more revenue you're able to generate, and then you're able to put that back into the product, invest into a better team, delight more customers, advance the product, get a better team, and then the, the, uh, this flywheel starts to spin, and then you continue to grow. And if you have all three of these things, now you're, you're on to something and your business is going to go somewhere. So we just want to keep keep you mentally aware that this is something that you need to work towards. And if you find that your business is stuck, go back to this, and I bet that you're missing one or two of those things. So you can, if you have a product and you have customers, the customers may not be super, super happy 
we can fix that with a team. But if you have no customers and no products or no team, you, you're, you need these things. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, you know, this is what, what we're gearing towards. All right, the problem. Let's talk about what that is. And things to consider here is, again, do not go long. This is just common mistake number one. You have to stick to the script. This is not a time to introduce anything new. We get it. This is your pitching. There's a lot. It's a high pressure situation. Nerves are heightened and you want to be able to connect with everybody. And the thing is, is that when you are trying to connect, you start what you want to start to be. You, you find yourselves trying to be all things to all people and you can't be all things to all people. So stick to what the problem is. Stick to the script and don't continue to add on. <clears throat> People are visual learners. And what we mean by this is stories sell, numbers tell. And when we are talking about the performance aspect of this, we want you to tell a story. So think about the customer journey that you want to take people. They find you somehow. The, per the perfect journey that they would go on, capture that and center your pitch or your story around that. So I would like you to I would like to introduce you to Gary. Gary has a problem that uh, gosh I, I I need to think about these problems before we do this on the fly. Um, Gary Gary what's what's your most recent problem that you have? Gary Gary needs to find someone to watch his his cat while he is sailing the seven seas um gary lives in the mountains and he you know, he has no he has no option you know he either can take the cat with him on his boat or he just leaves out 20 pounds of cat food while and, and hopes for the best until now we offer on demand pet services so that gary can go out on his boat and enjoy life as a yachty. So people are visual learners and they can start to see themselves like, yeah, I totally would love that too. And I can't go and enjoy the things that I want to enjoy because you know, I'm stuck to my home because of a pet. And I didn't think about that five or seven years ago when I didn't have the option to go out and enjoy life on the water. So take someone through that story and then you, you want to walk them through every step. And then that people being visual learners, they're going to remember that they're going to identify with that. And if you are talking to the right market, then you're going to move them hopefully down through your sales funnel and convert them into paying clients. Yeah. And if I can add that, it's really about helping people. So the way Tim is describing me, he's describing my pain point is that because I have this pet, I'm not able to be as flexible as I want to be. And so that's my problem. And that's painful for me because I, I have to struggle with what, who watches the animal and and or am I going to inconvenience somebody, whatever. But if there was a great petting pet service, pet sitting service that I, I could rely on and it was easy for me to book them and they were people around here that I knew or that I trusted, that would be great. So the, the problem is whatever my pain point is. And Helping to describe that for what for the typical customer that you have is the key to everybody at the pitch understanding why your solution, why the problem's a problem and why the upcoming solution will fix that problem. So and and to take that one step further, what we mean by don't going long is that you know that we don't want you to say, or what if you want to go on a vacation? Or what if all of a sudden there's a concert that you really want to go to? Or what happens if, and then you start listing off all these different things. So stick to one thing and take someone through that journey so that you don't go long. And we're telling that story. We're taking you through that journey. And, and everything at that point is much, much easier to remember. 
during that, you want to talk about how big the problem is. So now you're starting to tease a little bit in the sense of Gary's not alone. There are 150,000 people just in Hampton Roads that suffer from this same problem, whatever that number is. But we want to talk about how big the problem is. And that equates to an X amount of million dollar market uh, within the region. So you want to start, we just, we want to just tease in the sense that, yep, this is a problem. It's big enough that we can center a business around this. We don't, you, we're not suggesting that like, you, you, you don't want to be up there trying to pitch something that is so niche and so small that no one is going to want the product or service so uh, that you're offering. All right. That's the problem. We're going to transition into the solution. So again, we have 50 seconds to talk about that. Uh, the solution, here's some different ways that you can do that. And it's through the idea and the innovation. So things to consider here, especially when you're in a pitch competition or you're meeting a potential funder or an, an investor or a banker for the first time, is that your audience doesn't know you. So you can't, it's really, really easy to to and I am guilty of this, to think that everybody knows everything about me and my business because I'm just, I've been in it for so long. We have to start from, from zero and build upon that from the most basic standpoint, who you are, what the solution is, and carry everything through. So don't assume, especially from a judging standpoint, that people know you, they have a previous experience with you, and then they're trying to catch up, trying to figure out what it is that you're even talking about. So again, is the problem big enough? We we talked a little bit about this, um, but talking about that, yep, this is a problem. It's a growing problem. It's going to continue to grow at X amount of rate, or the dollar figure is expected to be this much by this particular time frame. There's many different ways that you can frame this, but is the problem big enough? And then when it comes to that solution, how are you different? How are you better? How is what you're doing more innovative and just a better solution than what is currently out there? And so an example that we use, um, or, or before I go into the example, are you 10 times better? You need to, Your solution needs to be 10 times better than what the status quo is currently out there if you are trying to change that consumer behavior. So when you think about what life was like before Uber, you had to hope that you could find a taxi. You had to hope that one was near you. You had to hope that you had cash because they didn't take credit cards. And then you had to worry about a tip. Uh, there is a, so many so many things against it. Then all of a sudden, Uber comes around. You're able to get a vehicle within a couple of minutes. It's going to take you where you want to go. You don't have to worry about paying cash. Everything is done on your phone. You don't have to worry about a tip. You know you're going to be safe. Loved ones can track you along the way. It is just, it's 10 times better and you don't you don't have to worry about it. So it was really, really easy for Uber to totally disrupt the market because it was 10 times better. So that's what I want you to think about in terms of when you describe your solution. We're much better because we do this, this, this um, compared to our competitors. But don't put your competitors down. Keep you in the positive uh, and don't start throwing shade or negative light towards uh, towards your competition. So team, this is one of the co three core things that we talked about in that flywheel. And so many people overlook it. So the things to consider here regarding your team, this is the place that you need to showcase your strengths. So like one of the things that makes Pitch Perfect so great, in my opinion, is the fact that I've worked with thousands of founders from the business side and Gary has worked with tens of thousands of people on the performance side. And together we work really, really well together so that we can ensure that you're going to provide the best pitch possible. And Gary's been a professor at multiple universities and he's helped people win millions of dollars and work through different uh, contracts. And I've helped people raise millions of dollars in funding from investors. So together, you know, we're, we're able to offer something that that I've not seen anyone else do, certainly not anyone locally in the Hampton Roads area. And why are you the ones, the why are you or why is your team the ones to solve this problem? So you need to really show, one, how well you know the problem, how well you know the solution. And, and this is just something you can't fake. It has to be in your heart and, and you just 
people can feel it. Like this is, I eat, sleep, and breathe solving this problem. You just, it is undeniable that you are going to be the person that is going to make that happen. <clears throat> um, another thing not to overlook is the fact that if you are a second time founder or a third time founder, because your first time or second time did not end positively, that's okay. The things that you've learned that first time and second time is invaluable. So being a second or third time founder is a that is a strength that you can leverage to make your team stronger. And think about the different things. You know, do you have patents? How many years of experience? You know, what have you raised money before? Are you a technical founder? Are you, you know, what what is it? What are those attributes that you have that you can bring to the table? And make sure that you show uh, showcase your your team is being evaluated in a lot of different ways that you don't know. And if you're missing things, you need to own that as well. Saying, "Yep," especially if you're uh, pitching to raise money, you, where the proceeds of this pitch are going to be so that we can hire a CTO or a, uh, a a full stack developer, so that we can build the code in house as opposed to offshoring it uh, to s some other country. So. Your team is super, super important. The marketability aspect, yeah, this is showing how well you know your customer. And this is really, really important. You need to identify who that customer is and you need to know that to the finest detail, age, gender, zip code, how much they make, what are the, what are the habits that they have, I mean, the, the more that you know about your customer, the better. And the more that, a, the, in, in, in return, the more you know those customers, the more that those customers are going to tell you, and they're going to tell you everything that you need to know on what they, what they want your product or service to be able to do. And when you know your customer so well, this is, you're demonstrating the market and when you know who you need to market to, especially when it comes to raising money, it just makes that process so much easier. Not to mention when you're talking to the people, if you know the people that are experiencing this pain point, they're looking for you just as much as you're looking for them. And then you connect and you establish that connection because you know the problem, you have a solution that's 10 times better than anyone else. And now you're reaching out to them to solve that pain point it all works together. So this is, you You need to show how well you know that uh, your market to the people you're talking to as potential customers, but also people, uh, either judges or potential investors. We want you to focus small and then expand. So again, start really, really small. And then as you talk to more and more customers, you're going to learn more and more things. And as you learn more things, and as you are generating revenue and delighting more customers, then it allows you to move further down that product roadmap and introduce things on a pace that you're able to execute really well, as opposed to trying to be all things to all people. When you're trying to be all things to all people, then you're you're nothing to everybody. So really, really focus on who it is that you want to uh, provide that world-class service to and start there. With that, how are you delighting customers? So what feedback have you received and share that feedback? So yeah, we, we've got our first two customers and this is what they said. We, uh, this is the reviews that we have on Google. This is what we, the reviews that we have on the app store, the Google play store. You know, how are you delighting those customers and what are they saying? Those testimonials and those, those uh, ratings, they're, they're important and they mean something, especially in, in the early stage. And it will continue to, to show importance as you continue to mature as a business. And one thing to add to that, this is a early stage competition. You're not expected to have hundreds or thousands of customers. We know you may have one or two. Um, this is, so don't, don't get intimidated by that. I'm more interested on the fact of, can you go from two to four from one month to the next and then from four to eight the month after that, continuing to light those customers and continuing to have slow, steady growth. Um, I would much, much take that over, over 
no growth or too fast of growth can be uh, just as detrimental. How you're going to execute is everything. So things to consider here is, you know, what is your why and why, why did you decide to take this crazy path of entrepreneurship on? A nine to five can be a whole lot easier. Entrepreneurship is not for everybody. So what, why are you doing this? What you, what your highs are going to be high, your lows are going to be low. And when you have that low day and you get punched in the face, what's going to, what is going to move you to get back up, dust yourself off and go after it again. So that why is what's going to keep you in the game and understand that. How are you going to make this a reality? Again, this is like, this is a deal where like, I'm either going to make this thing to uh, succeed or that's it. That's my only option. I burn the ship. I can't, I, I, I can't do anything else because this is my only option or it's living under a bridge in a box. Um, you're, how are you going to make this a reality? I mean, it's just, and what I want you to focus on, what can you do today versus I can't do this because nothing is more frustrating then here, I hear all the time that, oh, I want to start this business, but I can't do it until I get 10 million, until I raise $10 million. Well, you're not going to raise $10 million. So yeah, I'm just going to tell you that right now. It's not going to happen. So wh what can you do today? Yep, we want you, we would love to see you open up a, a Michelin star uh, restaurant. But before you're able to do that, can you start with a, a food cart that you're wheeling down Granby Street? And then you have a line of people wrapped around the block, and then you have to graduate to a food truck because you're able to make twice as many uh, gourmet hot dogs uh, with the food truck, and then you move to brick and mortar. I don't know, but think about what you can do today until, uh, as opposed to, I can't do this until I get to this particular point. And the reason this is so important is because investors invest in the people. They don't invest in the idea because, like I said, ideas are not worth anything at all. They're they're just that. Gary and I, we hear ideas every single day, multiple ideas every single day. And we have to make a, a quick determination of can this person execute on this idea? And if if they can't, then our time is done and we move on to the person that can. So valid validated ideas is what we're looking for. We're not looking for just ideas, and this is the platform to validate your business idea. And Tim, could I add that uh, this is really important because if, as Tim said, we hear all about ideas, and then we hear people even in in these pitch perfect programs where they don't want to share their idea because they're afraid somebody will steal it. Well, probably no one's going to steal your idea. And why not? Because they don't have the passion for making it work that you do. So they're not going to put all the time and effort into it. Um, Tim has a poster that we used to have up in, a, in an office we shared. And it said, the dream is free. The hustle costs extra. And it's like nobody else wants, it, probably nobody else has the passion to make the thing happen. So you're the one that has to make it happen. And that's why we want to know what your why is and are you committed and are you passionate to, to do whatever it takes to make this thing happen? It, that's the thing. Are you going to, do you have the, the drive and the passion to bring this idea to life? And with some guidance and people saying, yeah, that's kind of crazy. Why don't we dial that back a little bit? It's easier to dial it back than trying to gin it up. So and if you, I, I always say, I can't want it more than you. You have to want it more than me. And that's where the, where we get to see the passion is in the why. So. No, that's such a great point, Gary. That I mean, I hear so many great ideas and I see the pathway to becoming a hundred million dollar company, but I can't want it more than the founder. And as much as I love the idea, I don't have the bandwidth, nor do I have the same passion to make that thing a reality. I mean, it's just, that's the truth. So great point, Gary. Thank you for sharing.
Uh, your basic needs, everybody needs something. So things to consider here, <clears throat> your vulnerability is a strength. It is not a weakness. And so many founders feel the need to be alpha. They feel the need to know all the answers. And the, there are so many things that can go wrong. And there's there's just unthinkable things that are going to happen along the way. And you need to you need to step up and lean into that vulnerability and leverage that as a strength. I mean, it's just we want you to be coachable and listen. And the only way that you can do that is to be vulnerable. People don't if people want to help you, especially in the entrepreneurial community. But if you don't share what your needs are, then no one knows how they can help you. And like for me, I will take on one or two people to mentor. Um, but my time is really, really precious. And sometimes people, Hey, Tim, can you mentor me? And I'm sure we'll have our first meeting. And I'm like, well, gosh, if you already have the answers to everything, then why do you need me to mentor you? I like, you're, you're just wasting my time and you're wasting your time. Cause you're not listening to anything that I have to say, cause you already know it all. So, um, be vulnerable, share what your needs are, be open to ideas. At the end of the day, you're still the CEO the president, the founder, and you can may you have the ultimate decision on the direction of what that company is, but you uh, you need to lean into that vulnerability as well. Um, when it comes to building out your team, uh, another thing in terms of being vulnerable, you need to you need to look at what your strengths are and you need to look at be really, really honest with yourself with regards to what your weaknesses are. And even if it's not, even if you don't want to consider it a weakness, think about the things that you absolutely cannot stand doing, that you dread knowing that you have to do it, or you even hate doing it. You, I guarantee you there is someone in this world that loves doing the things that you hate, or that is really strong at the things that you're weak at. Those are the people that you need to bring on board and hire. You don't need to hire 10 of the same person that you are, because it just it, it doesn't benefit your, your company at all. You need to balance everything out and build on those weaknesses as opposed to strengths. Along those lines, there's a book called Who Not How. Yep. And as you grow your business, you realize that you probably, unless it's an accounting business, you're probably not gonna be a great accountant and you're gonna have to hire people to do things for you that you can't do. Or, because if you try to learn to do everything, you'll never, you'll never get past that. And so that's the hard thing for, entrepreneurs to realize is that think about who not how because you probably don't have the time to study for 10 years to learn how to do this thing that you could just part with a couple a couple dollars to have somebody else do it because they they've already they're already experts at it that's so. right yeah i mean with that i if you know how much you charge your clients per hour Say you're charging your clients $150 an hour for your service. I would much rather pay somebody $150 to do my bookkeeping for the month, knowing that that's going to free up four hours of my time. So now instead of spending $600 of my time, I'm only spending $150 to have someone do it. And I'm able to make $600 in revenue because I've outsourced that. So value your time, put a dollar amount on it and, and leverage it that way. And you'll be a whole lot happier for it as well. All right. Another secret sauce slide. It's a new ad. We talked about the problem and what how you have to describe it. If, if you don't talk about the problem, then there is no need for what it is that you're trying to do. So we, we address the problem. You have to talk about the solution. So you, you can't go into a pitch, totally skip over the solution because without a solution, people are gonna view it that you do not have a product. Product. And Tim, that, that product can be a service as well, right? Right. Yeah, but it's a yeah. tangible thing that's either a, a widget or it's a service, but it is a, it is a product. Right. And that goes back to the flywheel, product, 
or serve as being one of those things that you need to have on that the the, the flywheel. No market, no growth. So if you don't understand who the market is and who you need to go after, then you're 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 giving a, a, a tell, so to speak, that there's not going to be the growth that you need to show in your business. You don't talk about your traction, then you're telling me that you don't have customers. So again, this is not a contest that, hey, I have 250,000 downloads on this app. I'm really, I'm more concerned of the fact that, hey, I've got two people when I started this thing eight months ago, and they've been with me ever since. And no one is churning, no one is no one is leaving, or I have repeat customers. So what is your what is that traction? If you don't talk about it, then people assume that you don't have any customers. This is jumping ahead a little bit to the November timeframe, but knowing how you're going to make money. So if you if you don't have an initial idea, if you're selling a service, you're selling a product, you have a subscription model, whatever the case is, having an idea how you're going to make money. That is just, it's a really, really easy softball question in this first round for the judges to ask. So tell me how you make money. Even though it's not in the rubric, the judges, like, they just, that's just where their heads automatically go. So have that, that in the back of your mind. And I guess, Gary, we can talk about this now. Uh, we always talk about anticipating questions. And so if we know, we're telling you right now that that is a question that is often asked, so you can anticipate that. And if you're, you, you continue to time your pitch and you consistently come in at two minutes and 50 seconds, now you know you have 10 seconds to say, and hey, my business model is going to be a subscription-based business model that we're, you know, we're, we haven't finalized it, but we're thinking it's going to be $29 a month. Yeah, that 10 second, that, the, that, that is a great use of 10 seconds talks about your model, shows how you're going to make money, and now you're, uh, you know, the judges aren't going to have to ask that question. No team, no execution. Again, we understand you might be a solo founder right now, but you need to have an idea in mind in terms of where it is that you're going and how you're going to have a team. And then no performance. There's not going to be any memory you are just going to be one of the 10 people that happen to be on camera for five minutes and no one's going to remember you. So we're going to focus on that performance side. And the crazy thing is in these pitch contests, the judges rarely remember the names of the people, but they remember whatever it is that was being pitched. So they'll refer to um, the, um, you know, the uh, the uh, wicker furniture person <laughs> or the the whatever the product or service was guy, but they don't necessarily know that was Steve Jones. They just know they just remember that they might remember the Steve part, but they really remember whatever the product or service was. And they, they will. Ref I mean, Tim and I still to this day from things from back in 2016 whatever, we don't remember what the people's names were, but we certainly remember either one, how great or poorly they performed or whatever this crazy idea that they had was that was not fleshed out. And, but we remember whatever it was as that thing and, but not their names necessarily. So no, just, I say that just to say that what is memorable is, However you do it, well or not, they will remember not your name, but whatever the product was you were pitching. Yeah, which is why we say, say the company one liner, start teaching them how you how you want them to remember you. So you're like, hey, I'm Steve Jones and I make the world's only truly all weather wicker outdoor furniture. And that, you know, and then they may not get it word for word. But they're going to remember like, oh, yeah, the all weather outdoor wicker guy, you know, <laughs> or girl, you know, something. But lead them on that journey as opposed to uh, the other way around. So with that, we talked about no performance, no memory. So, Gary, what are some of the tricks of the trade that uh, that you would like to talk about? The secret phrase is dynamic duo. Dynamic 
Duo. Email that back to us so that you can get credit for watching this class. Yeah, well, the, the typical line it, when the question is an old joke, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? And somebody says, practice, practice, practice. That's how you get there. You know, not they're thinking, how do I get there physically on the roads in New York City? But the, no, the way you get to Carnegie Hall is practicing. And, and that's how you get there. So, um, and, and one thing to think about is the, the old adage that practice makes perfect, but it, it isn't that. It's practice makes permanent. And so whatever you're practicing is going to become permanent. So you want to be sure that if you practice the piano scales wrong, then they're going to be wrong every time you play them. So you want to be sure you're practicing the right things. So perfect practice makes perfect, not just practice by itself, because you could practice the wrong things. So you want to be practicing this pitch. And you got two weeks. So you want to be, I would say, run it. Once you get it down, don't wait until the day of the of the pitch competition. And, and then figure you'll have an hour beforehand. and then life goes crazy for you for that day. And then you don't have time to practice again the hour before. And so now you're you're kind of host. And so it, it's going to be whatever it is. So my suggestion is that <clears throat> once you've gotten what it is, what, gotten it down what you want to say, you've asked for some help, Tim and or I have given you some feedback and you want to keep honing it and then practice it every day, not for a long time, just so that you're aware of it, you know what you're gonna say. Um, I, I, I discourage memorizing just because uh, that could be bad. It depends on how you do that kind of stuff, but um, knowing it really well so that you don't get thrown off if something distracts you or whatever. But we can tell if you've memorized it and you're reading your eyelids, and the other thing we can tell is if you're reading from a script on the side of your computer. When this thing used to be live, we could nobody read off a script or it, it was bad. But nowadays, because we're on Zoom, it's easier to do that. And I recommend that you don't do that, that you, maybe you make bullet points. You've practiced it enough, but you have enough bullet points on the side that keep you on track. Your slides but, should be your guide. What's that? Your your slide is your guide. Exactly, exactly. So um, yeah, so that would be the the thing to do. Tim mentioned this earlier, um, and when you start with a question, you're wasting time. And we hear people go, "How many of you have ever blah 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 blah?" And we're on Zoom. No one's going to raise their hand, and uh, the audience is maybe fifty people that you don't even see. All you see is the panel people. So. Don't ask a question. Instead, you you could pose a, a situation. Imagine this, or as Tim was doing earlier, this is John. John's problem is blah, 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 blah. And he's, he's striving for a solution to be able to go on vacation and not worry about his cat. Oh, okay. Well, I can imagine what it's like to have a pet and not be able to have it taken care of. But to say, how many of you all have pets? And we wait for the answer. And do you have trouble finding a, someone to take care of your pet? And we're waiting for the answer. You've just eaten up 20 seconds that you don't have to eat up. So don't ask a question. Um, maybe a rhetorical question, but, but not questions where you anticipate a response. Next, don't start with your name because they don't care. They, uh, I would say start with a great attention getter, something that is that setting the scene or describing Carl who has this issue. And then once you've described that and you say, and the answer to Carl's problem is this, my name is Gary and I do this, which solves this problem. And then you go into the rest of the details, but people want to start with their name or they'll say, hi, my name is Gary. How y'all doing? It's like, you only got three minutes. So <laughs> they don't care who you are. Not yet. They don't have a reason to care. Um, a friend of mine used to be a speechwriter for a congressman, uh, a Congress uh, representative, a senator, actually. And he used to always say that you have to be willing to kill your darlings. Like you'll write a speech for this senator. He would write a speech for the senator 
for this event. And then he would so, be so enamored with what he wrote that then the senator would come back and go, that doesn't sound like me. Like, I can't say that. It's so not me. And and the, the speech writer didn't want to have to kill it because it was so good. And, and so he would always say, you got to be willing to kill your darlings. And this is that idea, is that you have to be willing to kill stuff that's in your presentation that is irrelevant to the story. It might be a nice thing to know later on in the finals. It might be nice to know if you're asked that at the in the pitch event by what by the judges. And another thing to think about, just as a segue to that really quick, is that when you're at the pitch in two weeks, I and Tim can neither of us can say to you if you if the, you answered all the judges' questions and you still have thirty seconds. We can't say, hey, go ahead and fill in something you left out because that would be unfair to all the rest of the competitors. So we don't do that. So we're telling you now, if you if you left something out or you end up with extra time in your Q&A and you want to add it, do it at the Q&A. If you've answered the judge's questions, add the thing you left out that you think might be appropriate based on whatever they asked even, though, but it wasn't a direct question. So anyway, so the idea is to get rid of stuff that isn't relevant to your story. And <clears throat> it's a story, and I like to say it's a performance instead of a presentation. The presentation is whatever's in the box. The performance is you, because they're watching you. They're watching you all the time. Even though you're on a Zoom screen, they're watching you. Are you looking at the camera? Are you standing up? Are you sitting down? Are you, is your energy, are you engaged? Are you, that's because that's when they see whether you're passionate about what it is you're, you're pitching. And so however you can arrange yourself to be, to demonstrate that you're passionate about it and that, that you're ready to, to take on the world about it, that's where the story and the performance come in. Yeah, real quick. Remember, Gary, we had, um, it, it, it was a couple of years ago from the performance side, this guy nailed it. And so, uh, and I think the name of the company was Nerdflex. And what no, he did, he was a personal trainer for people oh, that yeah, yeah. into comic books and comic cons. And so his whole thing was, I'm going to train you so that you can look like the superheroes that you, that you read about. But when he was done with that pitch, he took his T-shirt and he ripped it off and then he flexed. It. And so then that showed that, you know, that he's also the, this jack dude that, uh, you know, yeah, I'm a, I can train you to look like this. And it, that, that, that took the performance aspect to a, to a whole different level. Right. Right. Instead of just sitting and reading a script to us. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> and and was a little over the top, but yeah. But it everybody worked. was talking about it. everyone was like, Whoa. it's memorable. <laughs> yeah. It's memorable. The guy that ripped his shirt off. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that guy? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So for every slide or the line that you add, um, you want to ask yourself, does it help the story or is it hurt the story? Does it really add anything to the story? Or just because you think it's a good thing to add, is it really going to register? Is it, is it, again, am I trying to stuff 10 pounds in a five pound bag? And I've really, I've really done enough for them to, to pique their interest, the judge's interest, and have them ask me questions about it. Another piece of this is, um, what is basically you're going to the pitch contest and you're explaining a problem and your solution and how you would do this. And when you do that, it's really, really important that you think beforehand, um, and these four words are helpful, I think, and that is that um, uh, clarifying explanations anticipate confusion. So when you're creating an explanation for these judges about your product, you anticipate where people might get confused. So in the construct of the, the rubric that Tim has given you, also think about, am I explaining this in a way 
that's brief and concise, and also in a way that doesn't generate more confusion, and that in fact is laid out so that it does it does solve any con most of the confusion that normal people have when they hear about this idea. So think about where might someone get confused in my explanation, and then plan your explanation so that that confusion is eliminated. Yeah. Gary, do you so, want to go, uh, do you want to go into some of the slide slideology tips for folks? Yeah, one of the things I like when, when you're doing slides is that you want, I use a, a six by six rule, is what I call it, where you have no more than six lines on a slide and no more than six words on a line. And that way we can look at it quickly and continue to listen to you. Because if we have to read some whole slide, we have to make a choice. We can't multitask. We have to make a decision, a choice. Am I gonna listen to this person talking or am I gonna look at the slide and read it? But I can't do both things. And if I'm reading the slide and it's in any way different from what you're saying, then I'm not gonna pay attention to you. I'm now, I'm, I'm in cognitive dissonance and I just have to make a decision of uh, I'm just going to move on and I give up. So whatever you do visually, if you can do a chart, does the chart tell the story better than you having to explain everything? Here's here's a here's a a bar graph. Here's a pie chart that shows this comparison. Whatever uh, pictures worth a thousand words, does that show you better than me explaining it verbally? So that would be an idea. Um, oftentimes, it's uh, people appreciate dark slide backgrounds more than light light backgrounds because they are they're easier on the eyes, um, and they 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 help people to focus on what it is you want to say. And remember, your picture is going to be on the right on the screen. They're going to be able to look at you while you're. I think you get pinned there, and everybody else doesn't isn't there while you're speaking, but. Uh, we want them to look at you and be able to look at the slide and go, oh, and then come back to you and listen to you explain it. So th those are those are some slide tips that you might consider. Um, another one that's interesting to do, which I shared with uh, somebody who's on this call, actually, is to see if you can introduce the next slide verbally and then click the slide and change it, because then it gives the it gives the impression to the audience that you are in command of this performance. It's not leading you, you are leading it. Well, yeah, Gary, but this is Zoom. So I can't look at my what's coming next slide. No, but you can print it off and have it in front of you or the slide, there's five or six slides to a page or whatever, and they're taped on the side of your, of your monitor and or you got them on a board next to your monitor, whatever then, oh, okay, um, I can do that. Um, and, and another thing to think about is, to, and then you'll see what's coming next and you can introduce things as they come uh, verbally rather than visually first. The other thing is that wherever your camera is, you need to be, you need to have your, your whatever you're looking at on the screen up by your camera so that it looks like you're looking at the camera because that's how you make eye contact with the audience. It's not, if I look on my screen right now and I wanna look at Tim, I'm gonna go like this because he's over here. But my camera's up here at the top of my monitor. So as much as I can look near the top of my monitor and not be drawn to looking at myself, who's pinned in the on the Zoom frame, that would be better is to be able to be, to look like you're making eye contact with the camera. And this is so, all part of the practice, practice, practice. Absolutely. And I think in Zoom, you well, you get you have a you have a cell phone as well that you can set it up and video record yourself and then go watch the video recording, which is terrible. It's really spooky, but you want to go do that so that you know what people see when they're looking at you. And you don't have to worry about it. You go, oh, okay, well, I saw what I look like. And great. I'm not gonna be terrified about that. I know what they're looking at. I know how I want to look when I'm when I'm there. And uh, great, 
But yeah, practice, video record yourself, then go look at it. Then video record yourself again, and then go look at it. Do it for friends. Set up a Zoom session and say, hey, can I do my pitch for you? And I'm going to record it, a video record it, and then I want your feedback afterwards. Okay. People are happy to do that. So, and tell me you want honest feedback. I want you to not, not just tell me it was great because you're my friend. I want you to tell me what you liked and things you didn't like so I can make it even better. That would be great. That's right. And and so for those that are participating in uh, two weeks on the 16th, two weeks from tomorrow, we we open up the practice session at 5.30. We go live at 6. So that 5.30 to 6 o'clock practice session is not the time to practice. Like This is just us to make sure that we're all in line. We do a quick sound check. We share your uh, slides to make sure that we're good to go from that standpoint. This is just final dot I's cross T's type of thing. This isn't, uh, um, we will send you a virtual background to use. This is not the time to be like, oh, where was that virtual background email? I didn't get it. How do I do it? it like, we want to make sure that you're in the zone and you're just ready to perform. And so, I'm going to ask you how to pronounce your name, how to pronounce the name of your company so that it's right. When we go live, I ask everybody that if it's, excuse me, if it's not terribly obvious how to pronounce your name. So we just do all those stage pre-checks, if you will, to make sure that production is ready to go. Yeah, Tim's right. You need to be practicing long before two weeks from tomorrow. And uh, last thing before we turn this over to you all to either ask questions or hand practice is we mentioned Q&A a couple times. Q&A uh, is not anything to be terrified of. And the way the Q&A works for the micro pitch, we will have three judges. Each judge will ask their question. And then after the third judge asks that question, then you, then you have two minutes to answer all three of those questions. And we that is done purposely and by, by hmm. design to teach you how to start fielding questions when you have a meeting with an investor, when you have a meeting with a banker. We want to make sure that you're able to answer questions very succinctly and move on. Like if someone asks what the sky, what color the sky is, sky is blue. Then you move on to the next question. You don't have to go on this long explanation as to why the sky is blue or you perceive it as this particular color. What happens is, you either go long and then you don't have a chance to answer all the questions or two, um, we've had, since the Q&A is not scripted, you can't script that stuff because you don't know what the questions are going to be. This is the time that the passion of you comes out. We've seen either people talk themselves out of becoming a finalist or talk themselves into the final three because of the way that they answered the Q and A because the passion really came out, and then again we bet on the the team, not the idea, and so that has served them well. Um, and I know Gary, you have a couple couple of things to add uh, regarding the Q and A aspect. I was going to say, think about the questions that would scare you to death. Think about things that the judges might ask you that you would be terrified to answer, and then go construct answers for those. And ask friends to ask you, like, here's something, like, what's this? What's a question that would scare you, and or or have you know have them provide questions for you, and then go work on answering them. Way better to practice hard questions before you get asked. So easy ones, they're going to ask you that you probably know they're going to ask you. Those are easy, but it's the hard ones. It's what's what's a typically hard question, Tim? Uh, it would be typically financial types of questions. Yeah, like what, what is your cost of goods sold or something like that? Again, like we, the judges have the rubric. We give them guidance in terms of this is the level of the competition. But the thing about it is, is that typically when someone is really, they identify with you and what it is that you're doing, they can't help but think ahead and be like, oh, I really want to know more because I like what I hear. Um, so a lot of so sometimes they 
<laughs> they'll ask an outlier type of question, but you need to know how to answer that. And I know that there's sometimes that I, Gary and I were backstage and I'll just be like, mm, I wish that they didn't ask that question. But you, know, you, you, you have to anticipate that and know how. And the thing about it is, hey, we understand that this is something that we need to think about. We haven't got there yet, but it's on our list of things you know, to, you know, to identify or solve with the next 90 days, something like that. Um, and the clever pitcher is going to go back to the last, the first pitch competition or which are on YouTube, on the YouTube channel, or they're going to go back to the pitch competitions from last year and they're going to listen to them and they're going to and watch them and they're going to listen to the questions that were asked. Some of them may be similar judges, some may be different, but if, if I were pitching in this competition and I really wanted to win, I would be watching all of those old things to see what people did well and what people didn't do well and what kind of questions they got and how they answered them. And, we'll and then be, we'll release how the do you answer screen. those questions that the judges asked? Because there were 10 pitchers last time and there were there were three judges questions for each pitcher. And that's 30 questions that you would have automatically now that you've had to run through. That would be a great way to practice. Yep. And, and, and last thing, uh, then we'll turn it over to you all. The judges want you to succeed. They're not asking stump the chump questions to try to make you feel foolish. They want to see you succeed. So uh, don't, don't go into it being scared that they're trying to make you look foolish or silly. That's, that's, couldn't be further from the case. And afterwards, you can reach out to them. Or if they ask a question that you don't know, I would follow up with them. Hey, thanks for being a judge. You asked me this question. Here's the answer. You know, now you're establishing a relationship with them. And they're the, the judges that we uh, ask to, to participate are by design. And they have, they're very knowledgeable in this space. And they have very large networks of people that could potentially help you. Yeah, let Tim humiliate you and me. Tim and I are good at humiliating you. You don't have to worry about the judges doing that. We'll do that for you. That's right. I'm kidding. Any questions? Well, I know that somebody wants to pitch tonight. So, um, yeah. Is that hey, Gary. Hey, Tim. What's that? Hey, Gary. Hey, Tim. I would hey, love Eli. to my pitch. Pitch by you guys at that school with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Let me go ahead and present my pitch. And it looks like.